All right, so we're back uh, with another episode of Political Ish, and I'm here with my very honored, I'm very honored to have as my guest today, Speaker Pro Tem Kevin Mullen, um, Assemblyman from the South Bay. Is that right? What are your, let me... San Mateo County. San Mateo so County? Not quite South Bay. Okay. The edge of the South Bay, if you will. Definitely the West Bay. Well, I was just thinking South so Bay. So SFO, biotech, high tech, uh, beautiful San Mateo County coastline. Oh, it's that, an awesome oh, that district. That is awesome, man. man. Yeah. Four, is the Four Seasons in your district? The Four the Seasons. Half Moon Bay? Oh, uh, Half Moon Bay is just to the south. Oh, they screwed you. Yeah. My, my dad had it. He was a predecessor. He had Half Moon Bay, and then they took it away uh, from the Mullins, so I was not happy it from the Mullins that. on purpose. <laughs> this shall no longer be Mullen territory. Um, well, I am honored to have you here today, and this is a show that I have been looking forward to like you cannot believe. This is this is what That's a I lot of pressure, for. man. Right out of the gate. That's a lot yeah. of pressure, by the way. I actually envisioned different guests, but we've had to settle for <laughs> Kevin. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Let me tell you why you're here. Because I was having coffee with Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman. And it was right T-T. after the T T. It was right after right after the bash. And we were talking about the music and stuff. And um and he's you know, I was going over the different songs and you know how you know, I, we were just getting into the weeds, right? And he's like, dude, have you ever met Kevin Mullen? And I'm like, I've seen him, but we don't really know each other. Yeah. He's like, oh, that brother's down. <laughs> you got to get with Kevin. And I'm like, Kevin Mullen? Yeah. Like, we're talking about the same guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. I think Kevin Mullen? No offense. I mean, but like when I think of brothers who were down, I'm not that picture of Kevin Mullen. And right. he's like, no, man, that guy's a DJ. I'm like, then my ears start pricking up. And he's like, no, man. So wait a minute. He like knows his shit. He like he can mix it and he knows his music. And I was like, what? Kevin Mullen? And he's like, yeah, for sure. So um, I had put it on my list, right? I got to get to know Kevin Mullen. And then, of course, you know, coronavirus happened and, you know, we were all in different worlds and um, we weren't able to be in the Capitol. But I thought of this episode, which is the 12 defining hip hop songs of the 90s. And the first person I thought was, all right, man, well, let's test Kevin. Let's see if right Mullen on. is down. And this is the defining songs, right? Defining. So this is when you hear it, it transports you back to that moment in time in the 90s. That's how I was yeah. approaching this. Okay, and thank you for saying that. I appreciate that because that is exactly what this is about. So I don't want to hear from all these people like, you know, what about Nas? What about Tribe Called Quest? Sure. Right? Oh, yeah. what, what about... What about Foosh Nickens? You know, I don't want to hear all that kind of stuff. Because <laughs> this is, yes, this isn't like the greatest lyrical flow of the 90s. Yeah. You know, the most vi- the most meaningful lyrics. This is defining. So when yeah. you think about it, right, it transports you immediately to a time and a place. And I know there's one song on here that really does that for me. Like when I hear this song, when I hear the opening strings of that song, it's like. Brings you right there. Ah, oh, right there. Yeah. So now I'll give you a little context. So. TT was kind calling me a a current DJ. The reality is I'm a retired DJ, okay? And to be even more specific, I peaked. I pe- <laughs> okay, I peaked in 1990. Okay, so we are talking 30 years over the hill. So I, as a good politician, I'm, I'm sort of lowering the bar of expectation <laughs> yeah, right are. out of the gate here. Um, so this is mm-hmm. definitely me going back into time, uh, trying to rekindle some of those thoughts. Uh, and my, my, my crew was Sound Dimension. My, my handle was Cut Master Kevy Kev. Cut so I, could, mas- I could mix Cub and scratch. Or cut? Cut Master Kevy Kev. Cut Kev. Master Kevy Kev, because you could scratch uh, and mix. I could scratch, mix the whole deal. But um, again, uh, it's been a long time, and I've attempted a, a partial comeback at very, very rusty. Mm-hmm. Very, very rusty. <laughs> and in the, in the uh, intervening 30 years, uh, I developed uh, hearing loss. Uh, was which it from was that? definitely, I think, it, part related? of it was genetic. Part of it was definitely related to being a DJ mm-hmm. and just pounding my ears, uh, you know, loud audio in those ears for for whatever five, six, seven years. I did it, um, so it's made it. It's made the comeback very challenging. <laughs> so uh, let's put it that way. So why such a long name, Cutmaster Kevy Kev? I, I, I would have thought Kevy Kev by itself or Cutmaster. Yeah, well, that's the short version. Kevy <laughs> Kev. <laughs> it's even longer. <laughs> what got you into DJing? Were you just, I mean, what was the You deal? know, um, I had a good buddy who I, I put a little company together with a little mobile music company, Sound Dimension, but he had an older brother. It's always the older brothers that get you pulled into stuff. So he had an mm-hmm. older brother that was me- messing around with some, like, really crappy turntables, frankly, and playing basically like playing run dmc um you know a lot of stuff from like the late 80s and we go over the house and just be hanging out 
and something kind of clicked, you know, like, hey, we could actually do this. And I, I got just kind of drawn into the, the attempting to mix, beat mix. But it took, it took like months, months, years before you really could kind of become a good beat mixer. And, you know, you learn scratching along the way. Our equipment got better. Eventually, we graduated up to Techniques 1200s, which is kind of, yeah, yeah. you know, back in the day, that was sort of the yeah, standard, the you know, Newmark mixer and, and, you know, the full setup. So we do house parties. We do high school parties and all that. But really, it was, um, I got hooked on um, KSOL. Yeah, KSOL. 107.7. Oh yeah, uh, 107.7. Which, by the way, Assembly District 22 it was based in San Mateo. Their license was in San Mateo uh, way back in the day. And they had a mixer named Cameron Paul, who was basically the gold standard of like mixing DJs, club DJs. He had, he had DJed in the city, Club 412, and eventually uh, wound up at City Nights which was kind of like the anchor club in San Francisco in my, in my salad days, as my dad would say, back in the late 80s and early 90s, we'd hang out at the club. And basically, like, everybody else was dancing, like, meeting girls, having a good time. I was up in the rafters, like, looking down, watching the DJ do his thing. So I just became, like, obsessed with beat mixing and how basically they'd feed off the energy of the crowd and kind of take the crowd on a ride if you will and they, they did a live broadcast eventually on KML 106.1 KML in the Bay Area yeah and they would do like a Saturday night broadcast Evan the real Evan Luck and Cameron Paul would do uh these live broadcasts from the club and basically I came I became obsessed with that stuff wanted to be a club DJ of course that never never worked out a life intervened and I went to college graduated got into advertising then eventually politics but uh um it's always it's basically like when i look back it was such a highlight of, of you know like my, my college days mm -hmm. uh being able to to dj and, and have a good time yeah it's kind of funny you mentioned the uh um the guys yeah i was reading an article once uh, about uh, i think it was money b with digital underground and and he was talking about uh or no it was the digital underground dj who would do the mixing and the cutting for them. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, it kind of sucked on tour because, like, you know, uh, Shock G, Tupac, Money B, all these guys, you know, all the women would line up to see them. And he goes, and I would look next to me, and I got a, a line of dudes yeah, who are just nerds. <laughs> like, much. hey, what turntables are you playing? Hey, what are you? <laughs> you got it. In yeah. fact, like, I, we would do, uh, I just remember this one dance, uh, El Camino High School, my hometown of South City, I was mixing, and literally my, my business partner couldn't, be there that night with me and we would switch off you know so I, ha I had to like run the show for three hours and I had like a group of guys like literally like an oval around me like watching me DJ which was I gotta tell you a little intimidating for a 18 year old <laughs> but uh, it was a lot of fun man and you uh -huh. kind of you learn a little bit about yourself in those situations like you have to actually perform and uh, I joke with people like it actually helps me being speaker pro tem mm -hmm. uh, running the assembly floor because I've, I'm used to being up there uh, mm, yeah. controlling the flow of events. And it's, very, it's actually very oddly similar, if you can believe that. You know what, man? It's so funny because not a lot of people talk about that. But like at, on the Back to Session Bash, I put, I put an amazing amount of time into the exact mix that plays uh, yeah. the background music that yeah. people don't notice when they walk in. Um, um, I probably spend mm, over a hundred hours putting that together, yeah. right? I mean, I put like nine or ten days. Yeah, if that, you add it up, serious. solid. Yeah, um, for just like a, primarily a three-hour mix, um, and it's because it you you just want to control the flow, and mm -hmm. you know, okay, at this time, these are the type of people who are walking in. This is the kind of music that they're going to feel comfortable with. Okay, now you get a younger crowd. Now they're going to want to start drinking, and they're going to start moving. Right. And now, so now I need to play this, and now I need to mix it in. Right, and yeah. it's like, and you're you're taking them on the journey, and, and at, right. at some point you're going to bring that to a crescendo. If you do like mm -hmm. a long event, you bring it to a crescendo, and you got to back it off give it a breather and then build that crescendo back up again because you want it like absolutely peaking in that final half hour. Well, that's, that's, I know exactly what you're saying because that's what we do. So for like the 20 minutes before the act come on, comes on the stage. So like last year before little John comes on the stage, me and the actual DJ, DJ, the mixing DJ, we go up and we, for 20 minutes, just play cuts 
that mm-hmm. build it and build it and build yep. it and because you want to bring it to that crescendo and then you bring the act out. You got it. But it's so fun. It is yeah. so fun to say, can I get those people away from that bar and onto yeah. their feet? Yeah. And when you see them leave their bar stool and walk out and start moving and high-fiving, then you're like, ah! Oh! It's That's just it. an amazing feeling, isn't it? It's a fantastic feeling. Yeah. And and when we were re- reviewing this, when you tossed mm-hmm. this my way, I started thinking about some of these old songs. Um, what I was thinking about was the context of when I would put this song on, mm-hmm. immediately you would get a reaction. So um, basically a, a number of these are like, okay, when, the, when it's starting to lag a little bit and you need to inject some energy, it's a super recognizable song. And right when it hits, people are like, "Okay, it's it's on to the dance floor." So they're actually these are like jump starts, so, you know, to like get it get the party going. So I call it my twenty-two year old young woman high fiving her best friend test. Like if if I put something on and I see two twenty-two year old young girls go, "Oh my god!" There and high five, it's yeah. like that's that's the song I want. There right? you go. That's the song I want. Well, they high five on this. Yeah. Um, so here, here's what we are going to do. Um, again, this is defining, so don't come at me with your Nas. Right. And nobody's professing expertise here. Let me just be No, clear. no, we're not. we're going to get lit up on Twitter when somebody says, you, did you hear what this guy said? Yeah, yeah this, <laughs> yes. this is, I, there's, there's no expertise on hip hop from the 90s. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to you. Yeah, that. right. I'm just, no, I'm no, just no. an old DJ. Basically. You're just an old retired <laughs> DJ who peaked uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> Precisely. I can almost identify the moment that I peaked. <laughs> you did. Ago. It was that moment. <laughs> it's been downhill ever since. <laughs> um, so yeah, so these are the songs that just define that decade. They might not, and they defined it in many different ways. Like, it could have been, like, what that song did to the genre. Like, did that song change to the, the genre in some way? Um, one of my songs, I think, is something that people will go, like, what's that on the list? But it's on there for a very specific reason. Um, so uh, without any, you know, further, you know, I, you know what I don't like is the, word, is the phrase further ado. Is there another phrase instead of, well, without yeah. any further ado? I overused it, too. Ah! We'll, we'll come up with one before the end. <laughs> well, without any more yapping, <laughs> how about that? Why don't we all try that? Um so I will. So what we're going to do is we each have picked six songs, and then that will be our top twelve. We will start at our number six, and we will work it down to number one. So what it, if we have overlap? How's this going to work now? If you and I pick the same song, how, how are we going to how are we going to manage that? Then we'll we'll, we'll just deal with that. We'll be like those twenty two year old <laughs> girls in high five. <laughs> yeah, I think there's only one overlap. Okay, I think there is. Okay, I think it was pretty amazing. We picked very similar but yet different. Yeah, well, and so how old are you? I am uh, 56. Okay, yeah. so you're a little older than me. Um, and my w- so I actually talked to my mm-hmm. wife about this because she she's eight years younger than me, uh, and she had a better feel for like the mid 90s and late 90s. Yeah. Honestly, like my mine trends earlier. Like you know, I mean, I actually had a couple I couldn't put on there, but they were like 88, 89, 90. Right. Like, so early 90s was kind of a focus, but there is. Um, It'll be interesting to see what we come up with here. Yeah, there were some that were in the late 90s, like 99. Like, I was going to have Big Pimpin' on there um, by Jay-Z, simply because I think that was when a lot of people who weren't really into the genre heard of Jay-Z, yeah. and it kind of introduced him in a bigger scale to the world. Right. But I was like, eh, it's 99, you know. I don't, I don't know if yeah. that's definitive. Well, and for context, so we actually retired I sold my DJ stuff which to Jay Z. Like, God, I should never have done. I, so I sold it for like <laughs> five hundred bucks, both turntables, the mixer, ton of records. If I, I mean, if I had to do it all over again, I would have kept all the stuff, kept all those, all that vinyl. I mean, everything was vinyl. Now that nowadays, it's like you know, MP3s and all, all kinds of stuff, different ways to mix off your laptop. You know, back in my day, it was all just vinyl. And trying to find vinyl now, trying to recreate some of that stuff is really hard, man. It's like um, if anybody has lead on good old uh, vinyl, like late '80s, early '90s kind of stuff, uh, uh, send me a, send me a text. <laughs> so, so, did you have some favorite uh, go tos for your for your mixing for your scratching? Because um, I know uh, there were bin hounds, and they would just go try to find the yeah. most obscure. Well, know, the, stuff. The, the, like the best the best scratch record um, is it's time. It's a little cut. It it it. It's time, and basically that's it's such an easy it? cut. Al Nahafish, huh? 
Huh. Okay. We go, we're going way back, mm-hmm. like late eighties. Yeah. Uh, I should I should have I actually still have that record. I should have brought yeah. a little collection. That was here. a keeper. Um and you know, just like fresh, fresh, fresh you know, yeah, that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. You know? Um but the the mixing stuff, like to just give you a, a feel, like push it, salt and pepper. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Camera Paul remix, speaking of Camera Paul, is like the quintessential like late eighties, early nineties dance song. Uh, and basically we'd be playing that on a loop, but that always would get the crowd going. That, that would get those high fives yeah, yeah. on the dance floor. <laughs> yeah. Like that kind of um, era. But it's um it, you know, candidly, because it's like thirty years ago, I have to like recreate this stuff in my head and because I don't have the records that I used to have, it's all sort of like, oh yeah, remember that one? Remember God, that one? That- and then it, we retired. Basically, we sold our stuff in 1995, 96. So the late 90s are kind of a, it's it's sort of a, a lost set of years there for me. I was like focused on other stuff, trying to get a job, trying to like get a, get a real job, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and get my life going. So I've got a kind of a blackout period there in the late 90s. You know, you know me too. Um, I kind of did the same thing because I did 10 years in the military. And then um, I didn't go back to college until like I was 30, and that was in the mid-90s. So I started the 90s um, in the military and then like just doing odd jobs, like, you know, minimum wage jobs. And then in the mid-90s, I decided to go back to college and then the law school immediately after. So the mid-90s to like 2000, I was doing the same thing, college, law school, found a job. And so yeah. I, I kind of had to recreate that yeah. period. I, yeah, so yeah. I would listen to stuff, but it wasn't like I... Different. Yeah. yeah. So over time, you know, I've recreated, but like, it wasn't like the early 90s were like, I, I would listen to the charts. Sure. You know, all the time. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, should I you want yeah, to take the first one? Yeah, yeah, go for it. All right. So my first one is... Uh, so are we, going, are we going last to first? Last to first. Last to first. So I'll do my six, you do your six. I'll do... Okay. Then I'll it. do my five, you do your five. Got it. I think we only have one overlap, but I think it's a perfect place for it to overlap, too. Yeah. Um, my number six is Same Song by Digital Underground. Yeah. And why did I pick Same Song? So the reason I picked Same Song, so it's based on a parliament, on a par- parliament sample. Here's why. Because that is what introduced Tupac to the world. Um, six words, Tupac, go ahead and rock this. When Shock G says that and Tupac comes out with an 18-second verse that just, like, blows your mind. It's, like, so, so strong, so heavy. Uh, Tupac, go ahead and rock this. Now I clown around when I hang around with the underground. Girls used to frown, say I'm down when I come around. Gas me, and when they pass me, they used to diss me. Harass me, but now they ask me if they can kiss me. Get some fame, people change, want to live their life high. Same song, can't go wrong if I play the nice guy. Claiming fame must have changed now that we became strong. I remain still the same. Because it's the same. Um, I mean, you know, we're, we're going to play it here. Um, But Tupac comes out. He's, like, dressed like a king, being carried on a... On a uh, I don't know, whatever they call those things, on a board. (laughs) And he just throws that verse down, and it changed the world. Within two years, right, the man was a global icon. And it all happened on same song. Now, of course, I love the song anyway. Um, I think it's a song that could be nine minutes because the beat is just so good. With the all around the world, same song. Like, I feel that could just go forever. Um, But to me, it's a definitive song of the 90s because... It brought Tupac to the world. It brought him to, to a global stage. Um, what's interesting is that he had actually been a member of Digital Underground that whole time. Did you ever have any rap? Because you were in the Bay Area mm. DJing. And- I mean, di- you know, digital big Bay Area heavens presence. But I didn't know about the Tupac uh, connection uh, as as actual member of Digital. So you're 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 going to be bringing w- way more knowledge than I have <laughs> on this one. So, so you were you were on Google all, all weekend. <laughs> so I, was going, <laughs> I was not. So <laughs> so well, I, I if anybody has not um, if anybody hasn't uh, listened to same song, um, you have to go listen to same song. I have listened to just Tupac because I got to be honest, Money V's verse is pretty cool too, but. Tupac for what it means to the world and how viciously he spit it. It I have listened to that in the gym at least twenty five times in a row. Just on a loop, yeah. Boop boop boop. So boop. Uh, wasn't Shock G a cameo at a Democratic Party convention recently? Was I, I want to say like 
couple years was he? Yeah, a couple years ago, and yeah. and we caught like the tail end of it. But uh, it's interesting, like these guys from the '90s who are getting like reintroduced to yeah. a totally different generation, yeah. and they're they're like they're totally into it. They are, you know. It's like it, it's so it's it transcends yeah. time a little bit here. Um, we had him at the bash, I think, five years ago here at the Back to Session Bash, and um, he put on maybe the most talented show of any artist we've ever had. The guy is just a mu- he was a musical genius. I think everybody else puts on good shows, yeah. like E Forty put on a great show, but he was an entertainer. Yeah. Um, Shock G was a musician, and um, he did. He, he was just he was amazing. And oh, oh, of course, same song came out right after um, Freaks of the Industry came out, mm-hmm. and then the Humpty Dance, right? And so they were hot. I, I know a Huge. lot of people are familiar with Freaks in the Industry. Yeah, um, we are. <laughs> who weren't? Who, yeah, who didn't listen to K Soul, uh, yeah. KSOL? They just know Humpty Dance. But you got to listen to Freaks of the Industry. I mean, that was a yeah. song that made them. That's how we knew digital underground and then the humpty dance there was, a, there was a radio edit and then there was like yeah. the extended club <laughs> yes. version now that one is eight minutes long <laughs> so all right so there there is my uh excellent. number six excellent it, so, or number 12 so my number six is jump around house of pain oh yeah you got it yeah. and uh, i chose that because like, quite literally the moment you put that on people start jumping around <laughs> it's like if you're if you need a to inject some energy into the dance floor you throw that on and people are just up and it's it can get a little dangerous on the dance floor as well there's a lot of body banging to this song so just as uh, somebody who like sits in the dj booth if i need something i'll throw that on so so even today when you throw that on it's still, I mean, how long has it been? I don't know. What was that, 92, 90? Yeah, so this is early 90. I, th- I want to say maybe even 91. That's okay. like really early 90, 90. So we're going okay. almost 30 years later, right? And you yeah. put that on now at a sporting event, right? And yeah. people in their early 20s, or pre- teenagers, are just jumping yeah. around. I mean, I, it just, it's interesting you say that, though, because the, the arenas mm-hmm. do bring back a bunch of the kind of classic clips to get the crowd hyped oh, hype, so you yeah. hear a lot of this stuff that you know b- back in the 90s i don't know that they were running that stuff in arenas or whatever but now it's all part it's like a multimedia show if you go to a king's game a warrior's game it's like you're entertained at every time out break with music and it is a lot of like sort of classic stuff yeah and you know what i don't i don't want to invite the okay boomer comments that i'm sure i'll get yeah. but jesus is just true um, so, I mean, you don't go, you don't go to an NFL game and they put on Amigos, right? Yeah. That doesn't happen. You go to an NFL game and they put on something from this era. Um, and I don't, it just, it was so. It's got like generational crossover. Yeah, it was, right. Yeah. It was just so high, high level. I mean, high energy. Um, yeah. so that's good. I, I, I have notes. Uh, did you know who put that song together? No. DJ Muggs from Cypress Hill. Uh, it's actually the guy that did that he was shopping it around and then they made some edits to it and uh and it became what it is so yeah big props to dj mug mugs yeah he's uh he's doing well um because that's well i guess if he had songwriting credit he's doing well but if not yeah he's not doing so for his sake for his sake (laughs) so number number my number five is um all right this is this is the one that people might yeah, not know or agree with, but it's Slam by Onyx. And once we play it, people will probably remember okay. it. And there, there's a now reason. I need, I need to confess to you. Mm-hmm. I needed to look that up. But then when I put it on, it's like, oh, oh my God. Of yeah. course. <laughs> yeah. But I just didn't on it. I'm like, Onyx, Onyx. But then I put the song on. It's like, oh, of course, man. This was like an absolute... Yeah, smash at the time. Standing in my big boy stands, hurry up and give me the microphone before I bust on my pants. The mad author of anguish, my language polluted. Onyx is heavyweight. It's still undisputed. It took the words right out my mouth. I walk a mile in my shoes. I pay so many dues. I feel used in a building. I'm so confused. Now, excuse me, for example, I'm the inspiration of a whole generation. At the time, this was huge. For some reason, it hasn't really carried forward like a house of pain. Uh, like Jump Around has, or like Jump by Criss Cross has. Yeah. Um, like some of those, you know, from the same exact era. Right. Um, this one hasn't carried forward, and maybe it's because of the reasons that I'm going to talk about. Um, so this was out of, this was from 1993, and um, 
you know what I like about Onyx is that um, at that time, before that, <laughs> like today, we have rappers who try to be gangsters. But then I think when I see groups like Onyx, it was like gangsters who wanted to try to rap. And yeah. that's what Onyx was. And they made no excuses for it. They yeah. are like, we are grimy. We are gritty. We are the streets. And um, that's why I have them on there. Because prior to 1993, you know, you had a lot of um, what I call like the happy rappers or the cute novel rappers, like the Will Smith. Uh, well, you had Will Smith. You had the Fat Boys. You yeah. had, um, who else? Uh, Chub Rock. <laughs> uh, positive K. And, you know, you had all of these, you know, yeah. happy guys yeah. and okay. all about how, what, what kind of game can I throw down to get the girl and, hey, here's my new dance. Right. Onyx changed all that shit. Onyx brought it. I mean, yeah. and with the clip that we're going to play, you will see why. I mean, they were just about violence to be violent. It was no, it's like, this is what no we are. about it. Yeah, yeah, let the boys be boys, <laughs> right? That was it. Um, and then, you know, before that, we did have some hard rap with nwa um uh, public enemy but theirs was more like they were being hard to maybe push kind of a political agenda or to draw attention to issues or to make political statements no onyx wasn't doing that yeah i mean i mean let's think about it i mean the name of their album was back to fuck up that was the name of the album right it's spelled yeah. differently f-u-c-c-u-p um so i think once onyx came out Everything kind of changed, and it was a huge hit at the time. It yeah. went to like number three. Um, a little well, bit of a turning point there. It was. I think it was yeah. a turning point. <laughs> I think it brought. It was the end of the happy, fun, fun rap, and it became like, okay, we can just, you know, we can take this street now. Um, what's interesting? What I found out was interesting is Jam Master J was was actually the producer of Onyx's album, and he was listening to the album the previously I mentioned back to. And um, he said, we don't, have a, we don't have a single. You guys got to go back and get a single. Hmm. So they went back to the studio, and they had on MTV. And they're like, well, what are they listening to on MTV? I mean, he wants a single. We got to like, what's, what's the hook going to be? And um, Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit was really, really hot at the time and in high rotation. And so they were like, oh, okay. Yeah, we can do that. And so, little known fact, but Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit was actually the inspiration for Slam, for mm. Onyx's Slam. Wow. And that's why you see all the, if you watch the video, you see the, you know, all of the mosh pitting and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, Sticky Fingers, which you got to love his rap name. Yeah. Um, Sticky Fingers was like, yeah, we, you know, we saw the, the mosh pit and we said, yes, that's what we're about. Yeah. And so that led to the video. So anyway, Interesting. that's my number five. And that's why I think after... After Onyx, I think we saw rap kind of say, oh, we don't have to be the cute little fat rapper, you know, like like Heavy D. Yeah. We, we can be, you know, street if we want to be street. Yeah. So so Nirvana, quick quick side story. I was at a college DJ at University of San Francisco on the, college, on the student radio station. We had a sister station. K, I, I was at KDNS student radio station, KUSF. Uh, was uh, broadcast to the broader community, but it was located at USF, but they play alternative rock. They were sort of uh, Live 105 before Live 105 for you Bay Area people. Uh, but I remember a dude showed me, cracked open the, the uh, it's like a sample c copy of the Nirvana album. And he's like, look, man, these guys are going to be huge. I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, sure. I've never heard of these guys, whatever. He's like, you got to play this, you know, like these guys could be huge. But I kind of ignored it, and, and sure enough, man, like like about six months later, Nirvana just like exploded, <laughs> Un like unbelievable. But it it is interesting how this stuff works. Like college radio was that sort of initiator. Like it's stuff would get played on college radio, and then it would kind of transition to the to the broader mainstream. So it was kind of t interesting to just to see how that process worked a little bit. Like stuff just starts to trickle out there but this, it's totally different now but this is like back in the 90s what? that's how these things would start to get traction and then just suddenly like explode onto the mainstream how did he get his nirvana stuff you know he because <clears throat> what would happen is the these record companies would push these the the vinyl out to these rec mm -hmm. to, to college radio basically trying to get traction like play this trying to get some kind of organic reaction 
so the to s- the songs. So, you know, Smells Like Teen Spirit suddenly got traction. And I don't know, I don't know that, I don't know the whole history there. I don't know if KOSF was one of the first to play it or, or what have you. But um, back in those days, like college radio was really a, a kind of a portal. And once something got traction, it would cross over to the, the, the bigger stations, you know. Uh, so it's kind of like the equivalent of today's artists uploading their stuff, right, onto yeah. streaming services. Trying to get recognition, yeah. yeah. Tr- suddenly getting, look, I'm up to, you know, 25 downloads, and then yeah. suddenly it's like 25,000 <laughs> yeah. downloads. You're right. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny, because yeah, I don't think a, a lot of people listening were around during the time of vinyl. Yeah. And I was, a, I was a high school DJ. and High school? High school DJ, <laughs> yeah. Ah. Yeah, our went uh, Travis Air Force Base, uh, the high school there, Vanden High School. And they had a radio station, nice. but we would get all of those promo albums, man. Yeah, uh, we get like big boxes, and I always remember. Yeah, the yeah you'd smell. be like rip, ripping off the plastic, mm. like okay, what is this stuff? And every yeah. now and again, you find like every, a, gold, you get a golden a, nugget in there. Yes, you get like a little jewel, right? Yeah. And I remember sometimes you know we would get some stuff, and you're like, what is this? You throw it away, and later on, you know, six months, you're like, oh my god, yeah, that turned out to be a big Absolutely. hit. So, um, all right, that was my number five. That was your five. All right, so my number five, this won't be surprising given my Bay Area roots, and, and uh, Tony Thurman would appreciate this. This is from the district uh, in the East Bay. You can't touch this, yeah. Hammer. And I, so yeah. my first, uh, the first record I played uh, uh, at, cl- at, at de- uh, dances and stuff was um, Ringham, MC Hammer. Back when, before he was Hammer, he was MC Hammer. And Ringham was like a big dance kind of a hit, and just driving beat. So you can't touch this. Came along a little later when he yeah. really was a mainstream, full blown star at that point. Um, but he's got just an incredible trajectory in the bay area and you know at one point was i I think for the most part bankrupt Mm -hmm. uh and then you know attempted a little bit of a comeback there but he's like a you know he's just a bay area legend but that song you can't touch this that's a you know heavily sampled but when you put that on the crowd would go nuts like when this thing was hitting oh i think you're right absolutely dance floor hall of fame kind of song Really? So, so yeah. pe- that that got people away from the bar. A- absolutely, it still does. I think. Yeah. I think it still does. I, I think when you if you put that on there, I don't know if if it's the beat or if it's the lyrics or maybe it's just what we were talking about that sense of oh yeah, I remember that, and people get out there. But um, yeah, it still gets people out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I heard a, a story like too short told about MC Hammer. Um, Because, you know, we picture Hammer with the glasses and with the pants and with the, you know, like the Aladdin vest and doing his dances. Um, By the way, so I first heard Hammer um, with what you're talking about, his early stuff, when he had like 50 people on stage dancing everywhere. And it was one of the most amazing shows I had ever seen. Total performer. It was before Can't Touch This, right? It's when he had like that... He was really much more funk, much more funk dance, and but he just had performers everywhere in the power of it. It was like, it was like, he probably put too many of them on the payroll. Yeah, <laughs> right. He didn't think about that. He didn't think about oh, employee tax. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was just amazing. Yeah, so I know what you're talking about. Hammer before he hit it was a much different hammer than like you know the guy that did the Adams Family theme. Exactly, and then and then sort of toward the end. Uh, when he attempted to come back, he got a little harder, like trying to take a little bit of a different tag. Didn't didn't quite work, but no. Um, f- in terms of the Bay Area uh, uh, Hip Hop Hall of Fame, I mean, he's he's right there at the yeah, top. Yeah, he did the. I think was it the Funky Headhunter. Anyway, he tried to come back hard, yeah. and um, yeah, it didn't really work. Oh, oh, back to Too Short telling a story. Too Short once I I heard a story by Too Short saying, oh yeah, you know we picture hammers, this guy in the in the gold lame pants and the vest and glasses. And he said, that motherfucker is the hardest dude I ever met. He said, Mm. like, Hammer will walk up to you and, like, say some shit, right? And if he sees something wrong or if he feels like you've done something, like, no fear. He said, you do not mess with that dude. He is street. Don't let the gold LeMay parachute pants fool you. Yeah. Like, that dude is wh- where he is from. He's the real deal. He's the deal. And people have found about it too late. Yeah, right, because yeah. they tried to push him because they picture the, the smiley guy dancing. 
Right. Like, no. Different, don't, different do deal. Do not F with MC Hammer. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that was interesting. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So I am down to four. Um, my four is going to be kind of quick. I don't, I don't have a bunch of you know trivia on this one um, because I think what this song did for me is I think this song is one that just brings uh, that feel. And it was tough. It was. It's by um, uh, another group that sh- played at the Bash, um, d- uh, Naughty by Nature. Um, Tretch was an interesting guy. It was very interesting. I feel bad. I had a, a young female staffer who had to bring them from the hotel, mm. and they were supposed to go on on stage like at 6 o'clock. Yeah. And she had to, like, they, like, were, Tretch was just like, no. Wow. I'm not ready. And, like, we had, like, the speaker, the pro tem, everybody. Oh, yeah, we got, like, thousands of people, you know, waiting. And Tretch yeah, was like, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm not ready. But I got to tell you this. When he got out there, he did one hell of a show. Getting yeah. him the 50 yards from the hotel <laughs> that the, was the challenge. to the yeah. venue was tough. Interesting. Well, it uh, is kind of interesting. I'm one of these guys who, you know, were huge at one point who are now, you know, they're, they're not they're, – they're still names, but they're not, like, currently huge. Right. That adjustment down to kind of – and I'm not I'm – not, don't take any – No, like, right. Not, not casting aspersions on yeah. the – on, the bash, but you know, from going from a huge arena Correct. to playing like yeah. a small event, yeah, like what that does, kind of like from going to yeah. the ego, and I mean, they, you know, they still got to make money, and they're they're you know trading off that that sort of historical connection to a hit. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, some folks, I think, uh, like every now and again, I'll go to the uh, San Mateo County Fair, my in my in my district, yeah. and they'll bring in you know, like last year they had TLC, and I know some folks from behind the scenes, and they're like, yeah, they they. <laughs> Great ladies, but they definitely want to be treated as if like they are full blown current. Like, like this is nineteen eighty seven. Like this is nineteen eighty seven and not twenty twenty. Yeah. So <laughs> but, uh, what do they do yeah. for the for the L? What do they do for left eye? How did they did they have a different person or they do without? Yeah, her? they had they had a a, a slide in. Yeah. Do they? Yeah, different different performer. Ah. They were great though, man. They, yeah. They like still bring it and talk about intergenerational like. Oh yeah, thirteen-year-old teenage girls. Yes, old guys like me, yeah. and even older. You know, like you know, some gray hairs dancing around. It's like, man, talk about a crossover. And if you could pull that off, and you're huge, you know, in the '80s, and you're still out there playing right yeah, now. Yeah, what cro- the hell? You cross the boundaries, <laughs> and yeah. I tell you, in that kind of a setting, it wasn't a huge event, but man, it's it's an awesome performance, and everybody is totally into it. Do you, you know, know the only thing that brings a performance like that down? Do you know what the buzzkill at, at a performance like that is? It's these words. Now something from our new album. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, like, no, right. no, dude. All right, hon, time to no, go. <laughs> we don't want to hear that shit. <laughs> so, oh, so back to my number four, and it's OPP <laughs> by Naughty by Nature, and it's really tough. I, I, I chose OPP. Uh, as my number four, I had uh, same song, Slam, now OPP. Um, and I think OPP, just because when that song came out, man, it just captured everybody. Not simply because of the great Jackson 5 sample that they used. Um, I think that was one of the first really rapid flow rappers that a lot of us had heard. I mean, Tretch, in that song, his flow was just so rapid, so quick, that rapid fire flow. I think a lot of people like me hadn't really heard that before, right? Um, Heavy D was was good at that too, um, but I think on a hit, on a hit that big because that was a major crossover hit, and just w- over that beautiful Jackson Five sample, um, and then the meaning of the song, right, which captured everybody's attention. Um, that one is one that just takes me back, and it was tough. It was tough because Hip Hop Array is a great song, which wasn't as big a hit then, but I think almost. But you get it. I think the test of time has shown that hip hop array has probably become bigger for them. Yeah. Than so so that's OPP. my so we both went <clears throat> without uh, consulting ahead of time. We both went naughty by nature, but I did go hip hop array. Okay. Go ahead. And that was primarily because uh, again, as soon as you put that on, people start saying they start swaying mm-hmm. hip hop array. It's like so now you still see that. Like if you put it out at at a warrior game now, people will will be doing that. They'll be swaying back and forth. 
So I, yeah, I would say I think I think OPP at the time was a bigger hit. Yeah, just commercially was a bigger mm -hmm. hit. But uh, yeah, Hip Hop Parade may have a little more durability. And I mean, as soon as I I played that thing, just like uh, you know, does this make the list? As soon as I put it on, I'm like, yeah, this absolutely, <laughs> it's absolutely. Awful. So when we had um, when we had Digital Underground, or no, well, I'm sorry, when we had um, Naughty by Nature on. Um, and this is when I kind of figured this out. When we had Naughty by Nature at the party, um, I thought, oh, everybody's going to love OPP. And that wasn't the case. It was Hip Hop Hooray. Huh. Like, so back to what you're saying. Yeah. I think Hip Hop Hooray over the years for what, and I think it is that whole, it's that chorus, right? That, hey, yep. ho. And it's so I, distinctive. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah. great. I don't know who produced that. I should have looked that up. Yeah. But that was well, well done. Now, what were they like dealing with? Digital, uh, digital underground? No, uh, no. no. Uh, Naughty by Nature. Yeah. Um, huge. They had a big old posse. Um, uh, still, still, still have a big, posse. big. And we had to give every one of them their own room. And um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Tretch was very complex. Let's just put it that way. He was a complex individual. Um, but when he got on stage, he was awesome. He yeah. was very, very, very awesome. Um, he put on an amazing show. They did a lot of two. Uh, they did some Tupac stuff, um, but getting him, uh, God, Audrey, wherever you are, I want to thank you because you did such a great job. Um, poor, she was, she was so earnest, and yeah. she was over there. Uh, uh, David wants Mister Tretch, you know, yeah, over yeah, yeah. at the yeah. at the venue, and he was like, <laughs> "Who the fuck is David?" <laughs> right? Okay. Well. Yeah. Yeah, it scored no points, man. And so she really, she really had to get him over to the to the venue, and yeah. and they're like, yeah, he's resting, he'll be down shortly. Yeah. And it was like his posse that was down in the lobby, and they were kind of having fun, you know, yeah. messing with her. Yeah, yeah. Then finally, he you know he sauntered down, but he was he was interesting. But he put on a great show. Um, he was not as complex as Coolio. That was the absolute most uh, complex guy. I almost put Gangster's Paradise on okay, here, but God, almost put it on there. It would be an honorable what, what, mention. What was for he me. like? What was he like? You, you could be. I mean, what is, is he going to be listening to this? That's my. Is he going to? No, it's come after I, you. No, it's do I have time for this? He <laughs> was, I think. I think I'm going to do a story time podcast on just the Coolio ah, party that we did. Okay. Um, let me just mention a couple of key key yeah, phrases here. Yeah. Condoms, condoms and candy. Okay. Wandering the halls. Um, super late and super high. Okay. And I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but, that's, a, that's a quadfecta. <laughs> but, but I could string it together in one hell of a story. Yeah. So yeah, but save that. Save those stories. I will say that we okay. honestly don't have no, that would be its entire show. But he was about <clears throat> an hour and a half late. Um, the good thing is Coolio. Mado's really tightened up the bash uh, because before uh, when Coolio performed, I had the bar cut off because uh, I was like, well, I don't want anybody to be drinking while the performer is on. Um, mm. That was stupid. We don't do that anymore, right? Because now the performers are so big, like no one cares. Yeah, yeah. Uh, people are, people are going to watch. Um, and so at that time, though, when Coolio was the performer, um, I had the bar shut off. And so I've got like 1,500 people, and it's very small. Uh, area yeah. and they've already been drinking for two and a half hours and now the bar is shut off and because coolio is like over an hour late that means they haven't been able to drink for like an hour Ooh. and they're starting to riot it's and getting, we, it's getting dicey out and there. we can't find coolio Ooh. and i look out into this into the audience and i see all these like 20 year old you know 24 25 26 year olds staring at their phones lip syncing the words the gangster's paradise yeah. And I'm like, oh my god, what am I going to do? Like, how do I replace That's that? Stressful. That's a little tense. It's going to be a riot. Yeah. It all worked out at the end. Good. But it, it's it's a good. That was, that good. was a long hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a long hour and a half, especially for the folks that were waiting for their next drink. Yeah. Um. So all right. So now we're getting serious, man. Now we're getting to the top three. So my number three is uh, I want to make sure I get this right. 1994. It was this. It was this person's first single off their debut album. And um, I, I don't know, man. This song is just, lyrically, this song has, I, I feel, some of the best lyrics in, in rap. 
not not because they mean any not because not because they're profound but just because they give you they were so they were so damn cool and it it really told the story of his life and that's juicy when a you classic ah oh, man and and just the the whole we, now we sip champagne on our birthdays and uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or no, birthday was our worst day, and now we sip, sip champagne when we're thirsty. Yeah. Uh, and then the, I mean, Jesus, I mean, we get to celebrate collectively in his his journey and his ultimate. Success. Yes, yes, yeah. you get to follow his journey, and it meant so much. Oh, and I also like the fact that it was that M to me juicy, um, like another another so man. Pe- people really love to sample those early '80s songs, man. Um, cause I didn't even like him to me, uh, or that song juicy. Um, but, uh, but he did a great job with it. Um, and so it was kind of a, kind of a slow, if you think about the music, I mean, it's not what you would think would be, uh, the production, you know, yeah. it's not the, it's not the, it's not the music that you would think would lead to such a huge rap hit, Right. But the way he flowed over the top of it was just amazing. Um, yeah. That is a song in which when I, because I play it at every bash, but I usually play mixes of it or, or mashups of it. Because yeah. yeah. um, I don't want to, because it's it just a little, it brings it down a little bit because yeah. of the, the, the BPMs. Yeah. Um, so that is a song in which when people hear that song, I don't care if they're 21 or if they're 61, they know every damn word to Juicy Man. And they go over it and with I love it when you call me Big Papa. And they just high five and left and right. I I mean, for what it means emotionally and for being the first single by such a guy like Biggie, I gotta I gotta put that at number three, man. What are your thoughts? Awesome, man. So my number three, I'm gonna go bubblegum on you here. <clears throat> and you I'm going gum? I'm going straight nostalgia. Summer, summer, summer time. So the Fresh Prince. <laughs> Hold it! I love that song. This sort of a buzz. But back then I didn't really know what it was. But now I see what happened. It's the way that people respond to summer madness. Dude, this song. Okay, so I love that. When was you it? said defining songs of the '90s, I love like, that okay, song. The moment I hear this driving song, around. The moment I hear this song, it takes me back to like. The early 90s, I was living in San Francisco with some roommates, hanging out, basically carefree. I mean, you know, you think back in your 20s, not much going on, man. It's like, you know, you're trying to make your way in the world a little bit, but I just think compared to my life now, yeah, it's like, man, talk about carefree. What year was that? So 90, so I, I don't know what precisely the year, but I'm going to say 91, 92, 93, it's, so early 90s. It, yeah. But that thing had that thing has legs. You put oh, that, it does. You put that on right now. Everybody knows the words to the song, um, and it's a it's a defining '90s clip. When they talk about uh, the smell of a grill sparks up nostalgia. When I hear that line, I thought I get nostalgic immediately for uh, that time in in my life. The, I think '91 was that '91. Okay, um, 91. that song, like. Personally, it's funny you say that. For me, it, it, it that is another song for me. Just takes me back to a place, and and I, that was a war sample, right? Wasn't that a sample by the group War? Um, I think he went over the top of. I think I think not to put you on the spot or anything, but I think it I think it was um, I think it was was it Summertime by War? Um, I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll, we'll it put out. it up here. Yeah. Um, but it's a timeless with that with that synth, right? That beautiful synth coming in there. That, I mean, that, and this is before. I mean, I, I'm trying to remember here, but this is definitely before Will Smith was the Will Smith that we know today as a yeah. massive, massive uh, star, right? Ah, that's it. All right, Summer Madness oh, by so Cool and the Gang. Oh, Cool the Gang. Yeah. That and that is a good song. It, it's kind of funny because you're talking about the two Will Smiths. Yeah, I've always got to think about the two Cool in the Gangs. Because <laughs> I don't know if, for people that are listening, man, they're used. They're they're kind of familiar with the uh, Get Down on It and the right. Joanna, yeah. right? And that that Cool in the Gang. But 
before that, Cool and the Gang was a funky ass group oh, yeah. when they put out stuff like uh, Summer Madness um, and and Jungle Boogie and all that Spirit of the Boogie. They were funky as hell. And Huge. then I don't know what happened. They changed. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So this was after he broke up the Fresh Print stuff, right? And he kind of went on his own. Well, I so I've, I'm pretty sure uh, Jazzy Jeff was still with him on. Oh, was summer. he? I'm pretty sure okay. he was. Was he? Was still okay. with him on Summertime, but then um, you know Will obviously like went off and, and became a, a, a and... massive box office star, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, this song is just like so definitively. Uh, I had graduated from USF in 1992, still living near campus, not quite not not quite wanting to move on from my college days uh, for a good couple of years there, and this was just like on a loop. Yeah, you know, you know what, man, Kevin, I feel you on this one. Yeah. This this was one that took me back and still does viscerally. I feel this one. Right. Um, so yeah, summertime. I I, I, I I know that I know you're saying you went bubblegum because it's Will Smith, but no, that was and he had great flow on that too, man. That guy really he is he puts together some really crafty and creative lyrics. Uh, yeah. He really does. Yeah, he's he a does. genius. So no no hate there, man. I got you. Um, all right, my number here. Now we're getting really serious. Um, I think we differed on this, but we were kind of close. All right. right, different reasons. Um, I'm going number two. My number two is uh, "Nothing But a G Thing" by Dr. Dre off the Chronic. You know, and classic. I, I mean, how how can you argue with that? I mean, the reason I like <laughs> it's it's off of um, Leon Haywood. Uh, Leon, if you and we're gonna play it here. But Leon Haywood's I Want to Get Funky With You. It is, it's like pretty much, not stolen, but I mean, that is one strong sample. Let me just put it that way. That's one strong sample. And, right um, up to the line of legal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, so, so that one, uh, yeah, that that was good. So it was off the chronic. And here is what I love about nothing but a G thing. Nothing but a G thing is the song that when I hear it, that one just takes me back, man. And I can see the video in my head of just that. And it was such a cool video too because it was just like one night in the hood. Like going to the party, what you do at the party, having fun, and then they roll up in the morning, and you know that it was just a great, great video. Um, but that song, just the, the, I mean, when when Dr. Dre dropped that, um, it was just a, it was a whole new day. The whole thing opened totally. up. Everything that was the, that was like the Nirvana, right? Yeah. Like what Nirvana did to glam rock. Yeah. Um, well, and can we just talk about Dre for a second? I mean, talk about a giant. I mean, he, you know, inducted to the California Hall of Fame. <clears throat> this guy is, um, you know, a California legend. And a little little known uh, record from back in the day when he was with the World Class Wrecking Crew. Yeah, yeah, with makeup. So, so uh, the song that we had was Juice. It was just this driving, driving beat. And it was like basically the first, the first, my first exposure to Dre. It's like, what the hell is this world class wrecking crew? And this is, we're talking like 80, no, I, I remember say like 85, 86. This is when I very first started, like, what, you know, what is this stuff? Like, what, what is this vinyl? What are these songs? Mm-hmm. And that song started to get me excited about being a, being a DJ. Real, world class wrecking crew. About, so, world class wrecking crew. And that's like early, early mm-hmm. Dre. And then, you know, to see what his, his trajectory. And to see what he's done is uh, unbelievable. Yeah, because he was like no genius on that world class wrecking crew. In fact, they had a they had a guy who kind of put the whole thing together. The manager put the whole thing together. But I remember that because on KSOL, on KSOL, right? That's yeah. the kind of music they played then, and I I was very familiar with them. Um, and in fact, when I found out later he was part of it, I was like, oh, I didn't know that because you don't really. Yeah. It was one of those like almost disposable groups yeah. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So who would have figured, right? Yeah. Um, the reason I said the makeup is because Easy He Easy E has this line after they broke up talking about uh before um before before Dre did did a G thing no before he did nothing but a G thing Dr Dre was a she thing and he was referring back to the world class wrecking crew 
um, because they wore the uniform. Yeah, that, but yeah. that's what everybody did then. I mean, look at the Commodores. They had like the skin tight jumpsuits yeah. and stuff. It's just what you did. It's what you did. It was, it was about the show. Yeah. So um, I there was a Chuck D of Public Enemy, you know, was kind of that gener not the generation, but he was that era before nothing but a G thing and the chronic hit. And he had a really good quote, and I'm going to paraphrase it. And he kind of, he puts into words what I was thinking about, which was the the hip-hop music or the rap before Nothing But a G Thing was very, like, you know, it had a higher BPM, it was faster, um, it, it was harder, faster, harder, not like in uh, what they're talking about, right? But just the flow yeah. was harder and stuff, the pace, right? The pace the, of that. Yeah, the pace. And... Um, Chuck D said something pretty good. I'm going to paraphrase it. He said, yeah, you got to remember when we were doing it, right? The music before Dre, it was crack was the drug. So everything we do was fast, fast paced, hard, fast paced. Cause you know, it, it was about the crack, not that they were doing it. Right. But anyway, that was the, that was kind of the, there's a backdrop there. Yeah. The, that was the context. Yeah. And he said, Dr. Dre took us from the crack era to the weed era. Hmm. And it just became kind of kickback and just let it flow. And I thought, ah, oh, yeah. damn, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Well, speaking of weed. Okay. So my number two, gin and juice, uh. Snoop. So we're bringing Snoop into the conversation now. Now I'm back, I got me some sweet from gin. Everybody got their cups, but they ain't chipped in. Now these types of things happen all the time. You got to get yours before I got to get mine. Yeah. And this, so this song, <clears throat> uh, I mean, talk me. about played on a loop. So this is, you know, early 20s at, uh, at the apartment house parties when people would start to drink, you know, and the party like starts to really get going. This song comes on. It just like kind of embodies that. You know, probably like eleven thirty on a Saturday night when there's a party going on that, and, yeah. and there's music playing. This is, this is that song, and uh, that was my introduction to Snoop. I'm sure he did some stuff earlier, but that was mm -hmm. like when Snoop, in my consciousness, like right. just like took off. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess on G thing, I should have referenced Snoop also being you know a big part of that. But anyway, you you've just done it. Well, why why did you choose G thing? Nothing but I, I'm sorry, Gin and Juice over. Nothing but a G thing. You know, um, I don't know if I can even put it into words, but it's basically like, for me, as a former DJ, my DJ partner and I, this was like an anthem. <laughs> it was like an anthem. Like, we put this on, and not, not even so much when we were DJing. Like, we're just like driving around. Yes. This is not even so much a DJ song. It's like the, the drive right. around song. It's that song. If we're in the car together, we're putting that thing on. You yeah. know, so it, that just stuck in my mind. Like when you threw this my way, it's like Gin and Juice was actually the first song that came to my mind because I probably played that song more than any other song. <laughs> it was like me in my twenties. <laughs> it was so you're you're to that song like me and Tupac's verse in the same song. It was yeah. on a loop in my head, man. Um, so that's interesting. So both our number twos are from the Chronic. Yeah. Um, that's that's you know definitely album of uh it's got to be that of the contest here yeah yeah because and, and if we go to now as we move over to number one i think we'll see who the 90s were really all about um and well a couple of people um but i think we both agreed on number one yeah right number one is yeah we, this this was not pre-programmed uh -uh. this was <laughs> this was organic yeah and 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 frankly not too hard to, to uh, <laughs> uh predict you know i swear to god man california love Fresh out of jail, California dreaming. Soon as I step on the scene, I'm hearing hoochie screaming. Fiending for money and alcohol, the life of a West Side player with cows. I mean, and it's not just the music. And of course, it's it's kind of funny. And we're gonna play it here, uh, West Coast Pop Lock uh, by by Ronnie Hudson. Um, if you listen to that, have you ever heard that before? Mm -mm. It is almost like. Let's just call it a very strong sample. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, I, may, I may have heard it because I've got I've actually got like five different California Love versions. Yeah, yeah, on my phone. I, you know, I was looking for this one in particular. Like I heard it on a radio uh, on Sirius XM, I think. So mm -hmm. I. Going through all the different California loves, trying to find it, and I couldn't find it, so I like wound up downloading like five other <laughs> versions, the really like low tempo one, mm -hmm. and then anyway, it's it's a classic. And the, when I hear this song, 
you know, we're all involved in, in California politics, whatever. When I hear the song, it's like a strong, like, sense of pride about my state. Mm-hmm. You know that that we're the bomb ass state, most populous, you know, economic powerhouse. <laughs> it all it all kind of comes through in that song. Like this is the state that you need to be paying attention to. You well, know? then you know it's it's kind of you bring up a good point. Do you think we pick California Love because we're in California? I mean, I don't. I don't well, know what I think it has a special hook for me. It, there's like a California kind of a pride aspect, I think, to mm-hmm. this song that I think oozes out of this song. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely a hook for me. But even if it wasn't about California, man, as soon as you hear that beat, I'm hooked. Yeah. Uh, regardless of what you're talking about, like the drive of that, oh, of of the freaking the, uh, bass beat there. That's I'm hooked. I mean, it, I mean, I mean, I, I like I'm stuttering because the the production on this is just so amazing. You know, I interesting. Um, this song Dre had meant to or with the beat uh, Dre had meant to keep for himself he had a plan for an album the chronic 2 um and uh he had wanted this beat right for himself and apparently um Tupac was over at his house at his home studio after he got out of prison and he heard it and he was like I gotta throw I gotta throw a verse on that let me throw a verse let me throw a verse Mm -hmm. on that and so Tupac threw a verse on that and then Suge said no you gotta give it to Tupac you can get and Dre I think was you know not happy with that, um, but he's like nope, this you know you can still be on it right, but this is this no this is for Tupac this is going to be on uh, all eyes on me, hmm. and um, he he took that and apparently that created some division between Dre and Tupac Interesting after history that there. yeah um, but but I, apparently Suge Knight was doing this to everybody on death row he's like oh everybody give me your best stuff we're gonna yeah. put we're gonna put this on all eyes on me because um, hmm. he wanted Tupac to come out strong. And again, then there's the backstory of it, right? The guy's just out of prison. Um, little did we know how much time he had left on this world. Right. Um, but it's like he got every moment out of the time that he had left. And that that just that production, man. I mean, I've I, I've often thought that um, in the club, by 50, you know, um, was also by Dre had one of the best productions. But I, I think this is even better than that. And then of course you have Roger Troutman of Zap. Yeah, and um, he had a song, uh, "Dance Floor," and that's where the "Shake, Shake It, Baby," which yeah. is my favorite part of the whole song, because that is just yeah. so hard, man. Yeah, it's just the way they keep it going, and it's um, awesome. Ah, awesome. and then Tupac, you know, calling out all the cities. Uh, yeah, it's like a roll call. Yeah, I had to do the roll call. <laughs> it's just they're everything about that, the backstory, the context, the you know, the fact that Roger Troutman's on it with his voice box or talk box. Um, just everything about it, man. Got a lot of elements there. Yeah, yeah, and and Dre is basically, um, you know, obviously we talk about Tupac for an hour, but uh, just the genius uh, behind Dr. Dre and what he's meant uh, to the industry and the state. And uh, I was I was excited to see him uh, inducted in the Hall of Fame. I was there that night when he. Mm-hmm was inducted in the California Hall of Fame, and I'm glad he got that recognition in, in a kind of a mainstream way for the powers that be in California. Um, so anyway, yeah, this is uh, this is definitely a Hall of Fame song. Let's put yeah, it that way. Yeah, yeah, this this is a definite Hall of Fame. You know, they, maybe they should put this dang song in the California Hall of Fame. There you go. Okay. Uh, or it should be the theme, because this song, I think, I don't I don't see any, any end coming to this song. I mean, fighters still walk out. To California love, yeah. and if fighters are still walking out to California love, you know that thing's got legs. Yeah. So that's our number one. We both agreed on it. This was not pre-planned. Nope. I think a couple of things that we could say: um, Tupac and Dre, kind of running running through this. Yes. Um, and it's the era in which we switched over from crack to weed. <laughs> Got to slow your shit words, down. Your words, not yes, mine. Yes, yes, my <laughs> words, the non-elected. Uh, thank you so much, Assemblyman. I really appreciate fun, you. Really this a was, lot of fun. This was a great episode. Um, hopefully we can do it again on some other uh, love it. Uh, issue sometime. Right thank on. you very much. You got it, man. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Shaking in their boots, a visible bully. Like the roots disappear, Van Moose, you whack to me. Take them rhymes back to the factory. I see the gimmicks, the whack lyrics, the shit is depressing, pathetic. Please forget it. You're mad cause my style you're admiring. Don't be mad, UPS is hiring. You should have been the cop, hip hop, with that freestyle.
style, you're bound to get shot. Not from Houston, but I rap a lot. Pack the gap a lot. The flame's about to drop. Uh. Here come the 